Today I'm back in the aft cabin working on the batteries. There's nothing wrong with the batteries, or hopefully there shouldn't be, but there is a potential for something to be wrong with the batteries. since the great battery meltdown of October 2019 we've been doing a lot of research been sending a lot of emails back and forth and basically one of the situations that could have potentially caused the battery meltdown was the fact that they're not getting balanced charging caused by unequal lengths of battery cables so as you can see we've got option number one for wiring the batteries this way Then there's option two. Then there's option three. Then there's option four. We're gonna go for this one here, simply because it's the easiest for us to actually make happen given the space that we've got where our batteries are stored. We have three domestic batteries, so this four connection bus bar is perfect for the job. The power will come into here and each battery will connect to these separate little lugs. Today, I'm gonna to put these in situ. Then we're going to start disconnecting all of our cables from our batteries, see what lengths we've got, find out the equal ones, find out the uneven ones, and it might even require me to make a little trip into town to get them made smaller or larger or whatever. So we'll see how we go, eh? Well, here we are at the end of the job. The bus bars have been installed here. This is the negative bus bar. This is the positive bus bar. The cables we had made, all exactly the same length, have all been attached to the bus bars and attached to the batteries. So now we have what is probably one of the best methods for balancing your batteries when they're getting a charge. Now, I know some purists watching will probably comment why we have black cables running to our positive connections on our batteries. We are on a Greek island and you work with what you've got locally. Someone else may also point out that you shouldn't really use wing nuts to tighten down the cables to the batteries. And again, I reiterate, we are on a Greek island, you work with what you can get. I am going to order in two battery desulfators and we'll attach those to the bus bars and those desulfators will send a nice electronic pulse out through, through the batteries and that will shake off any sulphur buildup on the plates inside and hopefully extend the lifespan of these batteries. One desulfator for the house domestic batteries and one desulfator for the starter battery. I just spent the last hour sending emails back and forth with the very helpful Tom at Exalto Bearings in the UK. And the upshot is that it looks like we've been caught in the vortex that is the imperial and metric sizing. Anyway, the very helpful Tom at Exalto has said what he's going to do is he's going to raise a new invoice because they do have imperial measurement bearings as well, which I can then pay online from my bank. He will then mail the 44.45 millimeter bearing to me. And then once I receive that, I can mail the other one back to him and he will raise a credit note and deposit the money for that one back into our bank account. It's gonna take a little time, obviously, because COVID-19 is still around. The couriers are overwhelmed with work and there are fewer flights flying. So we'll see how long it takes, but things are in motion and the Cutlass Bearing Saga looks like it's gonna get solved pretty soon. Thanks, Tom. After a great email conversation with Tom at Exalto UK, we can see that the new bearing was shipped on Tuesday the 12th of May. Uh, it arrived in Brussels on the 13th and it also arrived in Athens, Greece on the 13th and was forwarded for delivery to us here in Limni. It is now the 18th of May and it's still not arrived but we're hoping it should arrive sometime this week. As you know, I make sea jewellery out of beach finds and silver wire and I've recently been making resin jewellery as well, which um, I'm really enjoying actually. It's, it's a fun creative process and uh, the last few days I've also been um, putting some resin on some new pieces like this piece of sea urchin which has got a little freshwater button pearl on it too, so that's really pretty 
and the other thing I've been experimenting with is uh, little photocopies of a painting that I did of a sea turtle and I'm embedding it into uh, a resin painting and then sort of adding a wave effect so this is going to be a nice little pendant for somebody so I'm just going to show you a little bit of the process that goes on with making these resin pieces I don't use epoxy resin I use UV resin because it dries quickly under UV light and it means that I can make it sort of when we're on the go and I don't have to wait for 24 or 48 hours while the epoxy resins uh, fluid and you know if the boat's moving uh, uh, I don't have to worry about that at all so without further ado let me show you some of the process it's quite involved I build the UV resin up in layers because it sets better that way I add either the painting or pieces of shells or other things that I find on the beach into the resin. Sometimes I use paint to uh, create waves or a little scene in the background. And then I just build up the layers on the top, on the back and around the side to create a really pretty finished piece. You can see how long it's been since we visited here. We've got cobwebs and a nice little spider living in the top there. But if you look down here, you can see that um, this anti-foul paint just comes away quite easily. Now if we just slap a load of anti-foul paint uh, on top of that, then it's, it's just not going to stick on. It's, it's just going to come apart. That's how easily it comes apart. So what we're going to have to do is strip quite a lot of the current anti-foul back. Uh, this is down to the primer. So if we can get it down to the primer, that's great. There are some spots, and I'll show you around the other side. So here on the starboard side, we can see that this is the primer, and there are places here where the primer's disappeared completely. So again, it's, there are places where we're going to have to take it right back to the iron keel itself. So quite a big job uh, that we'll have to crack on to soon because I reckon this is probably going to take us uh, a good week, maybe a bit more. And uh, we'll need to order in some epoxy filler and epoxy primer as well as our anti-foul paste. And of course some special Sikaflex that we can seal the hull and keel joint with to still give us some flexibility in that joint. Yesterday we did some scraping away of the peeling and lifting paint and primer and we realised that the job was obviously going to be a lot bigger. So this morning I went into the local hardware store in Limney and bought some angle grinder flat pads and I was a bit dubious about them at first but boy do they shift paint. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Thanks for the, thanks for the uh, lead on that Ant. What's basically happened is over the years the maintenance has not been up to standard on the the keel and I can see as I've been digging through here you know the patchwork things they've been doing so I've taken certain really bad places right back to the actual metal of the keel uh, there are parts that are still quite solid no no signs of any flaking or lifting so we've left them as is and basically just keyed out all of the bits to the keel where necessary so all that work I did yesterday picking it off with my trusty little blade it was all for nothing. <laughs> now tomorrow I'm going to, once this all dries up, I'm going to lie down underneath here and do the underneath of the keel bulb as best I can, considering it's still mounted on chocks of wood. Um, and then once that's done, we can give all of these areas uh, a light sanding to get rid of the oxidation that will happen in the 24 hour period between now and tomorrow. The um, the iron keel will start to oxidize and if we put the primer on top of that oxidized layer 
then the primer won't stick. So we're going to give a light sanding and then slap the uh, epoxy primer on all of these exposed bits of metal. And that is the beginning step for now. Before I bring you up to speed with what stage we're at with the keel, let's just talk about the elephant on my forehead, which is this up here. Let's just say it was one ouzo too many and then walking back home through a darkened boatyard and leave it at that. No, Ansha's not been beating me up. So anyway, with the keel, we've uh, stripped back all of the bits of uh, anti foul and the epoxy primer that was basically coming away from the surface of the keel. And as you can see, there's quite a few bits and pieces with a, a film of a surface of rust now growing on it. So before we actually begin the whole treatment of applying the uh, rust inhibitor or rust converter and then the epoxy primer and then the epoxy filler and then the anti-foul primer and then the anti-foul, we're going to obviously treat the rust as the step one. Um, before we do that, we will be sanding it back again to get rid of the surface rust, giving it a good wipe with a, a damp uh, cloth uh, to remove any dusty residue and then of course treating the rust. So here at the, uh, the front of the keel is probably where you can see the worst of this surface rust. So that's just a little wipe with the finger and you can see the surface rust. Now the reason we're going to put the rust inhibitor or rust converter on this is because the cast iron keel is a very porous surface. There are lots of little indentations that are faults from the original casting process and in order to get in there and get at all the rust we really need to uh, paint this rust inhibitor on. In our stockpile of goodies we do have this sea stuff rust remover which is a spray on type but what I'm actually going to be using uh, as far as I can or as much as I can is this Axton which is a Spanish rust inhibitor or rust converter which we got when we were in Spain so we'll paint that on as best we can and if we need to we will use the other stuff too. Our epoxy primer is a two-part primer as most epoxies are and I did buy this in Greece and this should be enough to cover all of these surfaces where I've bared back the metal. So. We'll get started on that soon. A big thank you to Murray Weston Sco for upping your Patreon pledge. Thanks, Murray. You're now an executive producer, and that means you get your name in the credits at the end of every video. If you've liked this video, give us a big thumbs up, and if you haven't already, subscribe and ding that bell icon so that you get notified of future video updates. Until we see you next week, stay healthy, and thanks for joining us on Sailing ABC.